Greetings everybody and welcome back to another Ring Theory video. In this video we're taking a look at Ringer Junctions, which is how to adjoin elements to rings that we already have. So we kind of already did this when we took a look at polynomials, because we started with this ring R here, and what we did was we wanted to add in this element, this formal variable x. And in a way, when you adjoin this x here, you're asking the question, well, what's the smallest ring containing the ring we already have along with this element x, so our union this element x if he wants. And really that smallest ring is indeed the polynomial ring. The reason why is because, well, rings are supposed to be closed under multiplication, which means if this x was really supposed to live inside of this ring, then also x times x, or in other words, x squared must also be in the ring, x cubed must also be in the ring, and in general, x to the n must also be in the ring. And also all combinations of x, x squared up to x to the n, but that's basically, well, the set of all polynomials. So essentially, when you want to adjoin an element, in this case, it's a general element x to a ring, you want to add all the powers of x along with all their linear combinations as well. So you want to add in the a1 x to the 1, a2 x squared, and then so on. Now, this element that we add doesn't necessarily have to be a formal variable. It could be an element that's living in a bigger ring. So let's take a look at a few examples. The first example I'm going to give are the so-called Gaussian integers. So what exactly are the Gaussian integers? Well, you start off with your ring Z and you adjoin this element I. So in a way, you're replacing these formal variables X's with these elements I. And what we're really doing here is notice that a Z is a subset of C. In fact, Z is a subring, but we'll discuss the subrings in the next video. And what we're doing is we're taking an element I inside of this ring C that's not already present in our Z, and we're trying to make the smallest possible ring that contains Z and I. Obviously, if we take the ring C, it's going to contain both of them, but it's not going to be the smallest one. So how would Z adjoin I look? Well, it's going to be the set of elements of the form A, plus bi, and then you might say, well, we better have a ci squared as well, maybe a di cubed and so on, just like with the polynomials, but you actually don't need to keep going with that. It's enough just to stop right at the bi. The reason is because i squared over here, that's exactly equal to negative one. So if you include this i squared, you're basically adding an extra, well, negative c, which is an integer, but you might as well just dissolve it into this already existing integer a. So there's no need for higher powers of i, it's enough just to stop here, and of course a and b must be integers. If you want a picture of the Gaussian integers, it's basically a lattice in the complex plane. And I just want to mention one thing here, which I'll talk about again at the end of the video. This element i here, that's a root of the polynomial x squared plus 1, where this polynomial lives in the ring z adjoin x. Okay, let's take a look at another example. The next example are the so-called Eisenstein integers. So how are these guys defined? What we do is we're going to define a constant in the complex plane, this zeta, to be e to the 2 pi i on 3. So the Eisenstein integers, it's defined to be the integers adjoin this zeta element. Now this zeta here is actually a root of the following polynomial, x squared plus x plus 1. And if you don't quite know where that comes from, well, draw out your complex plane. Your zeta is sitting over here. Zeta squared is e to the 4 pi i on 3. And if you do the vector addition, so you have your zeta, you add on the zeta squared, and then you add 1, which is an arrow pointing to the right there, well, it gets back you back to 0. Okay, so what exactly is a z adjoined zeta? It's going to be the set, first of all, of elements. Well, you need to have some integers a in there. You also need a b zeta, just like with the Gaussian integers. The question is, well, do you need c zeta squared and maybe a d zeta cubed as well? Actually, just like with the Gaussian integers, you can stop right over here, because once it gets to c zeta squared, well, you can express zeta squared as, well, negative zeta minus 1. But a linear combination of zetas and integers already exist with the a plus b zeta. So this c zeta squared becomes completely redundant. So a plus b zeta is all we need, and of course, a and b must lie in the integers. And maybe you notice something, the highest degree of the elements we're adjoining is one less than the degree of the polynomial that it satisfies. Actually, these polynomials need to be of minimal degree, and they're also called the minimal polynomials. Let's do a few more examples. 
In the first video, I introduced the set of a plus a b cube root of 2, where a and b are integers, and we show that this is not a ring because in order for this to be a ring, the ring must be closed, but if you take the cube root of 2 and multiply it by itself, you get the cube root of 4, which isn't already in there. So this guy over here is not a ring, so what can we do to fix it? Well, because cube root of 4 is not already in there, let's just add on an extra c cube root of 4. And if you take your a, b, and c's to be integers, this is the ring that we call z adjoined the cube root of 2. So notice over here, we also have to add in the elements we're adjoining raised to the second power. The reason why is because the smallest polynomial that this new element we're adjoining satisfied is precisely x cubed minus 2. So because there's a cube over here, then we need to go up to the squared term. You can also adjoin multiple elements to a ring, just like with our polynomials, how we could have polynomials in more than one variable. You can consider something of the form, let's start with the ring Q, and then I want to adjoin the square root of 2, and I also want to adjoin in I. So to construct the set here, we can think about this in two steps. You can have a Q, but you adjoin the square root of 2 first, and then you take the whole thing, and then you adjoin I. So let's think about Q adjoin square root of 2 for a minute. This guy would look like the set of all a plus a b square root of 2, where a and b are elements of z. So now let's go one step further. Let's say this is the ring that we have at the moment, and then now I want to adjoin i to it. So what exactly must we do? Well, it's definitely going to be the set of, let's say, s plus t i, where s and t, these are actually in this new ring here, q adjoin root 2. And just like I mentioned before, you don't want to have, let's say, a u times i squared in there because i squared is exactly negative 1, and um, you're just going to be left with negative u, but that's already covered by this constant s. Okay, but how can we write this a little bit more nicely, I guess? Well, because s and t are elements of q adjoin root 2, they're going to take the form a plus b root 2. So let's do a bit of a replacement here. This is going to be equal to the set. Now, s we can represent by a plus b root 2 for some integers a and b. And then we also have plus t, but t we can represent by c plus d root 2 for integers c and d, and then times i. So this was our original s before, this was our t from before, and here we have a, b, c, and d being integers. So let's clean this up a little bit over here. We have the set of elements of the form a plus b root 2 plus a c i plus a d times square root of 2 i. And of course, a, b, c, d are integers. So if you want to join multiple elements, you can just do this step by step. However, if you have something silly, like if you have the rational numbers and then you adjoin i, but then you also decide to adjoin, I don't know, 2i let's say. Well this is still going to be equal to the rational numbers adjoin i, because once you've adjoined i, 2i is automatically in there. If we adjoin an element that's already in a ring, then it kind of does nothing. And one more example to finish off the video, let's say we have the rational numbers and then I try to adjoin the element pi. Well, what do you think would happen in this case? Well the problem is over here pi is a transcendental number. What does transcendental mean? It means it doesn't satisfy any polynomials in Q. And because pi is not a root of any polynomial in the original ring that you're trying to attach new elements to, you're going to end up with the situation where you have something of the form a0 plus a1 pi plus a2 pi squared plus dot 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 plus a n pi to the n, and um, n is just going to be some natural number, and these ai's, these are going to be rational numbers. So you can't really stop with this, you have to keep adding more and more powers of pi because you can't represent a higher power of pi in terms of our previous powers. And that's because there's no such polynomial equation which pi satisfies. And if you really stare at this over here, you might notice this is basically the definition of a polynomial ring. Uh, it turns out this is isomorphic to Q adjoin X. So if you try to adjoin an element which doesn't satisfy any polynomial equation, that's basically the same thing as having Q adjoin X. Because a formal variable obviously doesn't really satisfy any polynomial equations in the base ring. Whereas all the other examples I gave above, um, they are kind of their own unique rings, they're not isomorphic to the polynomial ring. It's because the elements we're adjoining satisfies an equation in the polynomials of the original ring in which you're trying to extend. And these polynomials, which have these elements, these new elements as roots, must be the minimal polynomial, so it's the polynomial with smallest degree. 
And actually, if you know the degree, you know how many linear combinations you need to add, um, which involve the powers of that new element you're trying to join. So that's all for ring adjunctions. This yet again gives you a new way to create new rings from rings that you already have. In particular, if your ring lies inside of another ring, so it's a sub ring, you can just take an element of that bigger ring and then just adjoin it to the original ring. Um, and this ring adjunction, if you put square brackets, that's the smallest ring that contains the new elements. So we're going to be taking a look at sub rings as well as ring homomorphisms in the next video. Um, but that's all going to be for this video. So I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see everyone in the next video.